Hello students, this is Dr. M. Bhushnam, Assistant Professor in Zoology, Maharani Science College for Women, Bengaluru. Hope all is well. Take care of your good health during this pandemic situation. Well, students, today we shall learn another concept under phylum echinodermata that is echinoderm larvae their structure and significance the learning objective of today's session is to understand the structure and significance of various larval forms of echinodermata. The content includes under echinoderm larvae the structure and significance of four major larvae of echinodermata namely bipinaria, auricularia, Ophiopluteus and Echinocluteus larvae. Well, Echinodermata are the only phyla that includes all animals exclusively of marine forms. That is, they are, are all marine or aquatic. We know that echinoderms need to show all their developments of life cycle uh, within the aquatic environment. Almost all echinoderms are said to be unisexual or dioecious or gonochoristic. It means that the males and females and their separation are seen in the phylum echinodermata. Males are different from that of females. But there is no sexual dimorphism in the echinoderms. Otherwise, sexual dimorphism is absent. What does this term mean? It means that males cannot be differentiated from that of the females. We cannot differentiate the males and females by looking at the morphological details. So this is called absence of sexual dimorphism. At the time of breeding season, the males will produce the sperms which are said to be dinoflagellate. Uh, that we have dealt in detail when we have understood the develop, uh, reproduction and development of Asterius. Same thing will hold good for the rest of the organisms of echinoderms here also. So, sperms are said to be dinoflagellate haploid cells or gametic cells. Whereas females will produce the eggs which are homolycytal in nature. And both the eggs and sperms are thrown into the water during the breeding season and these haploid gametes within the water now starts uh, uh, interacting with each other and male gamete and female gametes will show specific interactions that will bring in the fusion process. So the fusion of male and female gametes is called as fertilization. So remember, fertilization process takes place 
uh, within the water outside the body of um, the mother organisms hence it is called external fertilization and we know that it forms a zygote students so down in the picture when we look at an example of starfish since we have done and learnt about this concept, I have kept the same diagrams here. Only at the time of breeding season, by looking at the colour of the gonads, we can easily differentiate which is male and which is female. Otherwise, morphologically, for the rest of the seasons, we cannot identify the males from that of the females. This is called no sexual dimorphism concept, but they exist. Uh, dioecious conditions, males are separate, females are separate. Well, if you look at the condition of development, it is said to be the zygote, which is a deployed single cell, acquires its multicellularity by the process of mitotic cleavages referred as the cleavage process. So mitotic divisions are referred as cleavage process. The cleavage is said to be radial because after division the cells are placed in a radial way. And it is equal because all the daughter cells will resemble equal in size. It is holoblastic because complete division of the cell will take place. It is indeterminate. Reason is that we can remove any part of the cells during the development. Uh, even after the removal of few of the cells from the embryo, the embryo will definitely form the complete embryo in future. So it will not affect the growth. Such type of uh, uh, growth is called indeterminate. And the development may be direct or indirect. Direct in case of the organisms of echinoderms that lives in the oceans of Arctic and Antarctic zones, where because of the cold conditions, many larval stages it may not be able to form. In such cases, we find direct development. Whereas in most of the cases, echinodermata will show the indirect development which includes larval stages. So after the cleavage process, we find the development stages which are said to be indirect including the larval stages. So down in the picture when we look at both the diagrams of right and left side, the single zygote cell after the fusion of the male gametic and female gametic cells now acquires the diploidity and shows the divisions mitotically which are said to be holoblastic and equivalent radiate, radial type and it shows the multicellular nature. The multicellular nature when we look at all the cells starts uh, accumulating in a single layer in a spherical mass enclosing a large cavity at the center. So this ciliated cells of single layer that encloses a cavity at the center is called as celoblastula stage. So after celoblastula we find an invagination process or infolding process of the single layer cells occurs on the posterior region and this further grows inside to form the bilayer structure for the embryo. So this stage when we look at the opening of a new infolding structure seen is called blastopore. Then a new cavity what it encloses is called archenteron and the new layer that infolds is called as endoderm. Students remember the outer ectoderm will have the ciliated cells whereas inner endoderm will not have the ciliated cells in it. This endoderm will show delamination along with the ectodermal cells and shows the presence of the third layer called mesoderm. So three germ layers gets formed during the process of um, the development which we call it as a gastrulation. 
So gas relation after its formation when we look at the arc enter run with the blastopore and blastopore will form the anus hence it is called deuterostome and this gastrula till this gastrula all the classes of echinoderms will remain common it forms a first a primary larval stage called dipurula larva remember students this is also called as echinopedium or also called as a early bipinaria stage so this stage is common stage or primitive stage of larva of all the classes of uh, echinodermata so this is about the developmental aspects related to uh, uh, phylum echinodermata now we know that after the formation of gastrula stage where three germ layers are seen we tend to find the indirect development of the organism showing the primary larvae primary larvae they are called because they do not show the adult characters in them so not even a single adult characters are retained by the body of larvae hence they are called primary larvae the speciality of this larvae is that they freely swim in the water uh, by, by using the ciliated epithelium and during this movement they feed upon the microscopic planktons hence they are called as planktotrophic planktotrophic what are planktons they are microscopic plants and animals present in the water so the larvae starts feeding on this planktons hence they are called as planktotrophic now after feeding they tend to move in the water so the movement is brought about by the ciliated epithelium now this echinoderm larvae are said to be transparent in nature the inner parts of the body of the larvae can easily be seen from outside so that transparency of the body of the animal i mean the uh, larvae is of then the larvae is said to be bilaterally symmetrical students remember the very important uh, point to be remembered here is that adult echinoderms are ra radially symmetrical in nature me to say adults will exhibit radial symmetry whereas the larval forms of the same will exhibit bilateral symmetry so you can divide at the center uh, by passing an imaginary plane into the body of the organism so that the mirror images of the organism can be brought this is called bilateral bi means two lateral means sides so symmetrical uh, 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 wave of the uh, organisms is seen when we cut them at its center through the mid uh, uh, planar division so this we call it as bilateral symmetry now the common features are of um, larvae is number 1 they are primary larvae because no adult characters are exhibited by these organisms next number 2 they have bilateral symmetry and number 3 is they are transparent number 4 is they are free swimming larvae and they start floating onto the surface of the sea water they are microscopic in nature they start floating when they float on the water surface we call it as pelagic so the larvae of echinoderms are said to be pelagic in nature they are planktotrophic and they have a complete digestive system present at the center developed from the endoderm so it starts from the mouth ends with the anus hence is called complete digestive system now outside the body of this larvae there is a band of cilia so we call it a ciliary bands it is like a rubber band provided with the cilia which is surrounded by uh, surrounding the organism at a definite position so like a band of cilia there is the presence on the body so these cilia does two important function number one 
they help in the locomotion number two they also help in uh, feeding process so that's about ciliary bands of the organism they are bilaterally symmetrical now with these special features what are they again i'll repeat they are transparent they are pelagic they are microscopic uh, they have bilateral symmetry and they have uh, uh, ciliary bands for locomotion and feeding then they have complete digestive system then they are said to be free swimming larvae then they have uh, um, planktotropic uh, uh, nature they exhibit and they are primary larvae these are all the points common points that you can write for all the larvae of echinoderms because these characters will hold good for the features corresponding to them then what is the difference there lies it it, it depends upon um, what to say uh, uh, the nature of the class to which they belong for example if it belongs to echinoidea it will form a larvae called echinocluteus if it belongs to holothuroidea it forms auricularia larva if it belongs to ophiuroidea it forms ophiopluteus larva if it belongs to asteroidea it will form bipinaria and brachialaria larva if it belongs to uh, crinoidea it will form a um, doliolaria larva like this different classes of echinoderms will produce specific type of larvae uh, in later stage but remember all this larvae will show the common features what we have explained till now so in different classes of echinoderms different types of larvae uh, with complete development is seen but they are structurally different uh, showing certain of common characters amongst them we know that phylum echinodermata is divided into uh, five major classes number one asteroidea two ophiridea three echinoidea four holothuroidea five crinoidea um, this concept you have learnt already and the representative examples when we look at asteroidea will include um, um, the larval forms of bipinaria and brachiolaria so this is uh, uh, the example what you find is of um, a sea star or starfishes then we have the example of ophiridea ophiridea includes a brittle star and the larva is called ophiopluteus echinoidea will include the examples of uh, um, sea urchin or echinus and the larva is echinocluteus then holothuroidea will includes uh, uh, will include the larva called auricularia and the example is uh, sea cucumber crinoidea will include the example of sea lily and the larval stages are dololaria larva uh, doliolaria larva and pentacrinoid larva so like this we have a different larval form specific for the specific class of echinoderms but we are not going to study all this uh, seven different types of larvae instead we are going to study only four that are specified in your syllabus that includes bipinaria larva uh, belonging to the class asteroidea ophiopluteus larva belonging to the class ophiroidea then echinopluteus larva belonging to the class echinoidea and auricularia larva that uh, 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 belongs to holothuroidea crinoidea larvae we are not going to study and under asteroidea we are also not going to study brachiolaria larva first we shall start with this the larva of um, holothuroidea that includes the example of um, a sea cucumber students when we look at the larva of um, holothuroidea that is of sea cucumber it includes majorly two uh, distinguishing larvae that is auricularia and doliolaria larva since your syllabus says about only auricularia we are going to concentrate only on auricularia larva when you look at this particular larva it is almost a dumbbell shaped or ellipsoidal shape slightly elongated 
showing very, very simple characters or primitive characters in them. So for all the larvae, this larvae of auricularia is said to be most primitive larva. Students remember, before I go in detail about this larval stages, we know that one common uh, larval stage is seen for all the echinoderms, which is said to be the primitive type of uh, uh, larvae or primary larvae exhibited uh, 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 seen in every class of echinoderm and we call it as uh, uh, echinopedium or early bipinaria or um, dipleurula larva. Remember that, okay? Uh, but most of the time scientists haven't uh, seen this larvae during the development because that is a common larva for all rest of all the uh, classes. So we are not going to study the detail related to Dipleurula. Instead, we are going to study specific larvae to the specific class. So that way, this la uh, uh, larva of Holothuridae includes Dolialaria larva and Auricularia larva. Since your syllabus says about only Auricularia, we are studying about Auricularia. Well, this is the larva which is a microscopic larva. It is said to be very simple and very primitive in nature. That's the speciality related to it. Now, the auricularia larva, when we look at, it is said to be a free swimming larva. It freely moves in the water. It is microscopic, um, showing the size of 0.5 to 1 millimeters of length because it's slightly elongated. It's a pelagic larva because it freely floats onto the surface of the water. It is formed within three days of the gastrulation. Soon after the gastrulation of three days later to it is the formation of auricularia larva. This very, very special feature of this larva is arms are absent. So most of the echinoderm larvae shows the body extended towards the lateral side, dorsal side, ventral side to form the extensions referred as the lar uh, larval arms. They are totally absent in case of auricularia larva. This point is very important. Which is the larval stage of echinoderm that doesn't show arms? It is auricularia larva. Then we also have understood a common feature of the larva is they show a complete alimentary kidna. Mean to say, the, it will start with the mouth, ends with the anus. The speciality in between part is the intestine, which is slightly curved. Now. They also show the presence of ciliary bands. It is also a common feature. <coughs> Excuse me. The ciliary band, when we look at, it is single. One ciliary band is seen, but it continues apart at the oral region and apart at the anal region. One portion of it will be seen near the mouth region, one portion near the anal region. So the ciliary band which is seen near the oral region is called oral ciliary band or simply called with the name oral loop. The one which surrounds the anal region is called anal loop or a, a ciliary band of the anal region. The speciality of these two is that the ciliary band near the mouth helps in the feeding process. Ciliary band near the anus will help the organism to propel in the water that is in locomotion. So oral ciliary loop will help in the feeding process and anal ciliary loop will help in the locomotion process. The next important feature related to it is, it is the larval stage, <coughs> excuse me, which is said to be bilaterally symmetrical bilaterally symmetrical mean to say we can divide the body of the organism right at the center by passing through a central plane of the body of organism to get two mirror images the very special feature of this particular uh, organism i'm sorry the larvae is it shows resemblances much with the bipinaria larva of asteroidia that is of uh, sea star the, when you look at the features, almost they look similar. So this is about the importance of auricularia larva of holothuridia. 
The next larval stage that we need to understand is related to the larval stage of asteroidia called as uh, bipinaria. We know that uh, asteroidia is the class that includes three major larvae. One is dipleurula, second one is bipinaria, third one is uh, brachiolaria larva. Three stages they have. Now, the first stage is called echinopedium or early bipinaria or dipleurula larva. Remember students, this is said to be an hypothetical larva. So, larval stage uh, 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 is present, but it is a hypothetical view of it. Generally, dipleurula larva, when you look at it, is ovoidal in shape, without arms, having ciliary bands on it, which helps in the movement. They show transparent, uh, a complete digestive system and starts moving in the water. And that develops into the structure of bipinaria. When you look at the structure of bipinaria, it is very interesting. Now, auricularia larva is very simple, elongated, but without the arms. But in bipinaria larva, when you look at, the body is elongated, microscopic, no doubt, but shows a triangular shape of the body having a broader base at this uh, uh, basal region that is at the posterior region and a narrower tip at the anterior region. So it looks somewhat similar to that of a triangle, slightly elongated. The anterior end of the body when we look at, it is said to be narrow, whereas the posterior end when we look at, it is broader. Now, the structure of the body is transparent, it is pelagic, microscopic, freely moves in the water. It is the larva of um, asteroidia. It, can, it is, uh, uh, can be divided into two equal halves. So it is bilateral symmetrical. Then uh, they show a plantotrophic nature of the body, etc. The other special feature is that the body is elongated, showing the extensions to form the arms. Arms are present. So these arms are very short and stubby. They are thick and short. And we have both paid and unpaid arms on the body of the organism. And we give the name of the arm by looking at the position where it gets extended as the arm. Remember this. Next point. They have the ciliary band. Ciliary band near the oral region and near the anal region. Near the oral region, the ciliary band is called pre-oral ciliary band. Towards the anal region, we call it as post-oral ciliary band. As we know, pre-oral ciliary band helps in the um, feeding process and post-oral ciliary band or anal ciliary band helps in the process of locomotion. So down in the picture towards the right extremity is the larva, uh, uh, larva of bipinaria um, uh, showing the microscopic view. It shows a complete digestive tract starting from mouth to anus. The features, as we have discussed, they are bilateral symmetrical, they are free swimming, they are pelagic larva because they float on the water. They show pre-oral region, post-oral region, pre-oral region that is anterior is pointed, elongated, post-oral is broader, roughly triangular body they have. The anterior end forms pre-oral lobe and posterior end shows the broader end. <coughs> Two ciliary bands are there. Pre-oral ciliary band and post-oral ciliary band. Um, that helps in the feeding and locomotion respectively. Down is the picture towards the right side, uh, right side showing the microscopic view of uh, bipinaria larva. When you look at bipinaria larva under microscope, this is how it looks. Coming on to the arms of the body. This is what is important, students. The variation with reference to the body is the arms here. Auricularia larva doesn't have arms at all. But when you look at bipinaria larva, 
there are uh, seven different types of uh, arms seen attached to the body. The first two arms are said to be um, unpaid arms. They are seen towards anterior side at the top. If you consider this round shape of the body, I am going to apply pressure and pull it to the top. When I pull it, there forms an arm. If it is towards dorsal side, back side, I call it as median dorsal arm. If it is towards the ventral side, if I pull, I, I, if I get an arm, I call it as median ventral arm. So we have two arms which are unpaid, one towards dorsal side, one towards the ventral side. There are, there are two arms which are median in position, unpaid arms. Rest of all the arms are paid arms. The paid arms are number one. First pair is pre-oral arms. They are present near the mouth. Second is post-oral arm. They are present almost nearer to the um, uh, posterior region. So here in the picture number 10 represents post-oral arm. That is seen much towards the left side of the diagram there. Now, in addition to these two, we do have the rest of four types. Number one, pair of anterior dorsal arm. Anterior means top side, that is upper side. Dorsal means back of it. So we are going to pull on two sides at the anterior dorsal location. We find a pair of arms there. Similarly, posterior dorsal arm. So down it is posterior side but dorsal. Then we have posterior lateral half. Lateral sides we are going to extend. So like this we have two pay, I'm sorry, two are said to be unpaid arms, namely median dorsal arm, median ventral arm. Rest of the five pairs are said to be paid arms. So they appear in pairs. Which are they? Number one, a pair of preoral arm. A pair of anterior dorsal arm, a pair of anterior posterior arms, I'm sorry, posterior dorsal arms, then comes a, a pair of posterior dorsal arms, then posterior lateral arms, then comes post oral arms. So, altogether, we have five pairs of arms and two unpaid arms. Altogether, seven different types of arms are present on the body of these organisms. They show presence of digestive system which is very uh, well developed, simple and is complete. Starts from mouth, ends with the anus. So that is about the importance of the first type of larva, uh, sorry the second type of larva that is bipinaria larva. The third type of larva that we are going to understand is pluteus larvae. So, pluteus larvae shows slightly differential feature than that of auricularia and bipinaria. The first major difference is that they all show similar feature. Which are the similar features as we have discussed? They are microscopic because they cannot be seen through naked eyes. Number two, they are pelagic. They float onto the surface of the water. They are said to be uh, free swimming because they have uh, ciliary bands attached to the body. Then they have a, they are planktotrophic because they feed on diatoms, planktons. Then they are said to be bilaterally symmetrical. The symmetry is bilateral. Then they are said to have a, a transparent body showing complete digestive system starting from mouth to anus. And they do have arms. Arms are very different. Then where is the uh, difference between a pluteus larvae and bipinarian holothuroidea larvae, when we look at pluteus larvae will show much elongated arms. Arms are much elongated. Okay, that's the major difference that we need to understand. And it is they show only one type of larvae to each of the class. When we look at the pluteus larvae's first feature, this larval forms can be regarded as the modification of auricularia larva of holothuroidea. So the first larva what we have discussed in today's session. That larva has given rise to the pluteus larvae. The same has given rise to bipinaria larva also remember that. The second important feature is that the uh, auricularia larva had a single ciliated band and that single ciliated band 
is now broken into different bands attached to the arms, tip of the arms. When you look at the echinoderm, echin I'm sorry, a pluteus larvae, they show elongated arms like this. So to the tip of this arms, you find the attachment of a part of cilia, ciliary band. So the arms as they move, with the help of ciliary band, it starts moving. So that's the speciality. So ciliary bands are, are located much towards the uh, tips of the uh, uh, arms. So long arms with the ciliated band margins are special features of the pluteus larva. Then it has comparatively smaller preoral lobe. Metrostate is very much narrow compared to the broader base. Then next important feature is that the postsenal part is quite well developed. Metrostate the broader part is seen towards the posterior end. Arms are supported internally by means of calcareous rod. Calcium rods are present inside. Sometimes they may appear outside as in case of echinopluteus. You can see certain margins with a slight uh, uh, bone-like structures attaching. One towards posterior lateral side and one uh, 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 almost nearer to the stomach region. You find ring-like structures attaching. Those ring-like structures are called as calcareous rods which are present outside the body supporting um, the arms. So they are called as epaulets. So, so calcareous rods are present inside which supports this slender arms of the body. Both the larval forms that is uh, uh, Ophiopluteus and Echinopluteus, both the larval forms possess postural arm, la la anterior lateral arms, posterior lateral arms, and posterior dorsal arms. Now, so this is a, that was about the importance of uh, Pluteus larvae. Now, the first larvae under Pluteus is the class Ophiridia, includes the Ophiopluteus larva. Uh, this is the larva of the brittle star. Students remember, this is the only larva of the brittle star that we find. Along with that um, um, primitive larva, which is hypothetical larva called the dipleurula. Now, this echinopluteus larva shows the common features like bilateral symmetry, then transparent nature, pelagic nature, then shows the presence of microscopic body, planktotrophic, etc. In addition to all these features, when we look at, they have majorly three types of arms. Number one, anterolateral arms. Number two, postoral arms. Number three, posterior dorsal arms. So students remember, The first one is anterolateral, postural, and posterior dorsal arms. Anterolateral arms are formed after the fourth day, uh, by fourth day of uh, gastrulation. And by tenth day, postural arms develops. And by eighteenth day of development, posterior dorsal arms are developed. They do not have preoral arms, they are totally absent. And there are long arms attached to the body called posterior lateral arms. So these are the arms which will indicate or differentiate echinopluteus from that of the ophiopluteus. So ophiopluteus speciality is presence of very long posterior lateral arms that gives the V-shaped body for this organism. Longest arms are, are these posterior lateral arms in the body. Now. All the arms are directed towards the anterior side. Why they are directed towards the anterior side? Because internally the slender arms are provided with the calcareous skeletal support of rods. So that's the importance of uh, Ophiopluteus larva. They have the ciliary band which is uh, undivided. Uh, generally they are attached to the arms itself for the locomotion. Digestive system is complete, showing starting from the structure of mouth ends with the anus. The larva freely swims in the water and becomes adult by the process of metamorphosis. So this is the importance of the larval stage referred as Ophiopluteus larva. 
The next larva we have to study is the larva of Echinoidea, that is larva of sea urchin called as Echinopluteus larva. This is also the single larval stage of this particular class along with the um, hypothetical dipleural larval stage. The features of this larval stage when we look at, they are microscopic, almost oval shaped, showing bilateral symmetry, free swimming larva. They are formed after 7 to 30 days of gastrulation. And they show the ciliary bands which are attached to the arms to help in the movement. There are the fully developed echinopluteus larvae may show four to five larvae or uh, larval arms and uh, in pairs, but most of them will show six pairs attached. The special feature of this particular echinopluteus larva is that Posterolateral arms are totally absent. In Ophiopluteus, they are the elongated, most elongated arms, but here they are totally absent. This is the difference between these two that you will have to understand. So it is not V-shaped, instead it is like a bokeh. So preodal arm is present in them. Uh, the other arms are anterolateral arms, posterodal arms and posterodarsal arms. According to their positions, we give the names. Each of the arm is elongated here, slender, provided with the support of calcium carbonate. Students remember, an additional feature here is that arms from outside, if it is an arm from outside, it is supported by a ring of a calcium carbonate called as a epaulette. So we have epaulets attaching to the body to give much more strength and uh, support to the uh, transparent body of the organism. So that's the importance of uh, Echinopluteus larva. The digestive system is complete. Now, the uh, inside body part when we look at, it shows the presence of hydrocele and vestibule of the body which helps in the formation of um, uh, radial canals that in turn forms in future days the ambulacral system. The larva undergoes metamorphosis to form the adult. Now, after we understanding the structural details of this four larvae of echinoderm, let us understand the significance or evolutionary significance of this larvae. Point number one, students, this is very important for short notes. Number one, they may ask you either one of the larvae to describe or two larvae they may ask you to describe and give evolutionary significance. So this is a very important concept for you to understand. The evolutionary significance of echinoderm larvae when we look at, number one, the larval forms of all classes of echinoderms will show certain of common resemblances, so common features in them, which are they, number one, all larvae will show the features like they are coelom, they have uh, two coelom, they are bilateral symmetrical, they are free swimming larvae, they are pelagic, they are planktotrophic, they um, uh, freely swim in the water. They show complete digestive system. All these features, they have ciliary band. All these features are common features shared by all the uh, uh, class of larvae in Echinodermata. So, a common ancestor which was having all these characters would have given rise to all these larvae. Okay, in the due course of evolution, and hence, this larvae would have given rise to their adult in future. So, common ancestor for the larvae was seen because of these common features amongst them. <coughs> and thereby, they would have given rise to different species later in the form of adults. It is seen that dipleural larva uh, uh, discovered by Bather in 1900s and Pentatula larva by Simon 
1988. They found that there were two hypothetical larvae that can act as the ancestral forms for this echinoderm larvae. But most accepted larva is the pentatula larva. Because diplurula larva, even though it is a hypothetical larva, um, in most of the um, uh, larval stages of echinoderms, that larval stage they won't, uh, the scientists haven't seen. So they haven't spotted much of the time. Then, adults, when we look at of the echinoderms, the special feature is that they should be very inactive and show low phyla characters in them, like radial symmetry. Where do you find lady radial symmetry? You find it in podiferins and cylindrates. That symmetry is exhibited by the adults here. Whereas the larval forms when we look at, larval forms are very active here. They swim freely in the water. They show bilateral symmetry and high organized symmetry. Then they disperse into different environments and survive there. And thereby the adults are dispersed into different environments. Here the larvae play a very important role than the adults. Reason is that the adults will show the characters of um, 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 uh, low phyla characters, whereas uh, larvae will show the high phyla or complex phyla uh, characters in them. When we look at bipinaria larva, it resembles like that of tornaria larva of balnoglasses. Down in the picture towards extreme, right is the tornaria larva. This tornaria larva also resembles like that of auricularia larva. So when we look at these three larvae down, one is tornaria larva of cardates, that is of balnoglasses, heavy cardata. The middle one is bipinaria, towards right side is the auricularia. All these three larvae resembles with the features almost the same having a broader base, a narrow apical end showing all these features. Presence of mouth, anus, all are uh, position wise they are same. They all show bilateral symmetry, they show transparent body, they show ciliary bands, they show complete digestive system. All these features resemble the same. So evolutionary significance of these three larvae when we look at, they resemble much same. Then, coming on to the pluteus larvae of Echinoidea and Ophiridea, both show almost similar features except for the presence and absence of the uh, uh, lateral arms of the posterior side. So, this, the rest of all features almost resemble the same. So, what does this concept indicate here? When we look at Ophiopluteus and Echinopluteus, they resemble the same. When we look at auricularia and bipinaria, they resemble the same. So this indicates that the similar features when are expressed by different organisms in the same environment, it leads to the concept called as convergent evolution. Students, let me give an example here for you to understand it easily. Say suppose if a mammal like bat had entered into the air then um, insect also entered into the air then uh, bird also enters into the air we have seen bat entering into the air insect entering into the air and a bird entering into the air when the organisms enters into the air to move they require the wings so wing formation is seen for all these three organisms so wing is common, the structure of wing is common, to perform the function also common, that is flight. But the structure wise when we look at, the wing of bird is differently organized, they have feathers covered, they have muscles, they have bones, etc. When you look at the wing of the insect, it is papery, chitinous, dead material it is made up of, with wings. Then the wing of bat, when we look at it, is the forelimb modification where the skin uh, attaches from the abdomen into this particular layer of, uh, I mean, region of 
uh, four limb bones to form those patagia, the wing. So wing structure is common because they have to propel in the air. But the structural details of the wing when we look at it is different. This is what we call it as convergent evolution. What exactly it means? Different organisms when they get into a common environment, they share common features in them. In that way, Ophiopluteus and Kinoplutius share the common feature even though they belong to different class. Similarly, Pipenaria and Auricularia. What type of evolution it forms? It forms converging evolution. When we look at the larvae of Holothuridia Ophiridia, Holothuridia uh, forms uh, Auricularia larva, Ophiopluteus is formed from Ophiridia. So, our auricularia larva and Ophiopluteus larva, when we look at their features, are not matching. The arms are totally absent here, but here it is well developed. Similarly, Asteroidea and Echinoidea. Asteroidea larva includes Bipneria, Echinoidea larva includes Echinopluteus larva. These two, when you look at, they show evolutionary dissimilarities, no similarities between them. Such larval dissimilarities, if it is seen in the same group of organisms within same phylum, different types of uh, uh, dissimilarity characters, if it is forming, it leads to a condition called divergent evolution. Totally differs, but they will have origin from a common ancestor. So, uh, ancestor is diplural larva. You remember the Echinopedium larva, from which all these larvae had developed, but they show dissimilarities. So, this is what we call it as divergent evolution. So, it can form convergent evolution, it can even lead to divergent evolution. But remember, larvae play a vital role because they show much complex characters than that of their adults. So echinoderm embryology, when we look at, it is the adults which are highly modified organisms when compared to rest of all the adult organisms of the phyla, rest of the phyla. So echinoderm embryology cannot provide any valid support for the hypothesis of um, that cardates arose from the echinoderm adults, but we can prove that they are arrived from their larval forms because tornaria larva belongs to the cardate group, that is hemicardate group, uh, which resembles the features like that of bipneria and auricularia. So that way we can say larval forms would have given rise to the adults of cardates. Well, students, after we understand the concept of echinoderm larvae and their evolutionary significances, we shall try to answer the questions of MCQs. Let's rush. First question. Which larval form of uh, crinoid, which is the larval form of crinoidia here? So, we did not deal with one particular larva that is doliolaria. D is the answer. Which larval form has the epaulets? It is echinopluteus. So, answer is B. Which is not a larval form of echinoderm among this? Ophiopluteus we find, Bipneria we find, Brachialaria we find. So, Nopleus is the larva which is of arthropods. Arms are absent in which of the larvae? It is an auricularia larva. So, answer is C. The symmetry exhibited by larval forms of echinoderms is bilateral symmetry. Answer is A. Which arms help the larva to adhere to the substratum? It is related to the asterius. So we call it as brachiolarial arms. So answer is B. C star belongs to which of the order, I'm sorry, class here. It is asteroidia. B. The larva present in Ophiridia is Ophiopluteus larva. So answer is D. Bipinaria larva is found in the development of which of the organism? It is C star. Answer is B. Now, understand the concept uh, with little interest and concentration. An example of parallel evolution. 
with similarity between larval forms such as Ophiopluteus and Echinopluteus. Ophiopluteus, Echinopluteus both are moving towards one uh, 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 directional evolution. This always leads to both are Pluteus larvae uh, share the similar character. So, answer is B. Convergent evolution it will form because parallel evolution always leads to similarity of the characters almost. <coughs> well, students, the outcome of today's session that we have discussed is we all have understood the structural details and the significance of uh, larval forms of the phylum Echinodermata. The references include uh, web references of Wikipedia and Britannica.com then uh, book references includes invertebrate zoology by P. S. Verma and textbook, a modern textbook of zoology by Kotpal. With this we are completing the concept related to the Echinoderm larvae and uh, the evolutionary significance of them. It is very important question students for a major uh, 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 answer that is the essay type answer. Try to uh, understand the concept. If you have any queries and comments, please post them to my personal WhatsApp number. Take care of your good health during this pandemic situation. Thank you all students.